Thank you, Isaac. Welcome to everybody who's here. It's good to see just about everybody here. We have visitors as well, and that's good. I'm not going to go over and, and actually read this, but if, if you go to Matthew chapter 21, uh, you'll read there the parable of the two sons. And the father goes to one son and asks him to go and work in the vineyard. And the son says, no, I'm not going to go. But he changes his mind and he does go and do as his father had asked. And the father goes to the second son and asks the same thing. And that son says, yes, I'll go. And he doesn't go. And Jesus then asks his listeners, which one obeyed the father? And of course, despite the fact that he initially said no, it was the first son who went out and did what he was asked to do. And so a message that we can take from that is that obedience isn't all about words. It's about action as well. And I want to apply that principle this morning to a biblical subject to which it seems to me uh, even Christians are giving less and less attention. We say that as Christians we uh, are committed to doing the will of God as revealed in his Bible, and yet I wonder if there are not areas in which we fail to do that. We just ignore God's will. And so... I want to start off this morning by going to the book of Malachi, Malachi chapter 2, and in a moment we're going to read verses 13 and 14. Malachi being the last book of the Old Testament, uh, the Israelites are here under God's law. Uh, it's possibly somewhere around 430 BC, and even though it's only just over 100 years since they came back from Babylonian captivity, once again, they have drifted, and God has to point out to Israel here in the book of Malachi all sorts of ways in which they've drifted. And so we read in Malachi chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, And this second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favour from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. God was not responding to their, their worship here, and the people say, why? And God say, well, it's because you've been faithless to your wives. And you'll notice here at the end of verse 14 that he links the idea of marriage to covenant, right at the end of uh, verse 14. And covenant is defined uh, in several ways according uh, to uh, the um, Hebrew lexicon by Strong. Uh, covenant here means a compact. And if you look at the Macquarie Dictionary, a compact in this context, means a an agreement between two parties, a contract. William Dynas, in his themes on Old Testament theology, says that a covenant is a solemn promise made binding by an oath, which may be either a verbal formula or a symbolic action. Uh, just shortening that down a bit, uh, a, con a uh, covenant is a binding agreement. And then you've got the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, which defines a covenant between two human beings as a solemn mutual agreement. So from that perspective, then, marriage starts off with a solemn agreement between a bride and a groom, a serious commitment to one another. And back when I was a marriage celebrant <laughs> conducting weddings, I would talk about that as, as we led into the wedding ceremony. 
And if we take a hypothetical couple, let's, let's say David and Mary here, I might say something like this. David and Mary are here today to make a commitment to one another. It will be a serious commitment made in vows before God and before you as witnesses. Such vows are not to be regarded lightly. Their commitment is to be a lasting one because it is in long-term commitment that marriage and family life find their greatest fulfilment. So that was something that I would talk about uh, and emphasize in regard to weddings. And indeed, even as I did pre-marriage counseling, we talk about that as well. So following the language here in Malachi, to break up your marriage, to walk out on your marriage, is to be faithless uh, to the one to whom you've made a solemn promise. You've broken your word. Uh, you entered into a covenant with them and you broke it. And so it says there uh, in verse 14, partway through, uh, the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless. And then uh, towards the end of verse 15, so guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. My job, as you know, used to be in finance many years ago, uh, both uh, lending money and also handling the collection side of that. And my job... Uh, particularly on the collection side, was to ensure that people abided by the contract that they had entered into. Now, I don't want to view marriage simply as a cold, legalistic contract, but nevertheless, God is saying it, it is a serious commitment about which we need to be lastingly serious. If we go over to the passage that Isaac read to us a moment ago over in Matthew chapter 14. And here we read of uh, the imprisonment and death of John the Baptist. We've moved over now about 460 years uh, since the time of Malachi. Uh, John had been arrested by Herod and was eventually put to death. And the reasons for his initial arrest are given in Matthew 14, verses 3 and 4. For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Now here in verses 3 and 4, we've got a number of people named besides John the Baptist. For instance, we've got Herod. Uh, this is Herod the Tetrarch in verse 1 otherwise known as Herod Antipas. And Herod Antipas was one of the sons of Herod the Great, who by this time uh, was dead. And uh, he, uh, Herod the Great, his father, had quite a few wives. Herod Antipas was a son of Herod by his wife Malthus. And uh, when Herod the Great died, uh, Herod Antipas, the son received part of his kingdom. That's why he's called Herod Tet the Tetrarch, because that indicates a portion. And um, Herod Antipas, Herod the Tetrarch, then ruled over the area of Galilee and then Perea as well on the eastern side of the Jordan. Herod Antipas had been married to Phasaelus, who was daughter of the Nabataean king uh, Aretas IV. So we've got Herod the Tetrarch and Herod Antipas. We've also got reference in verse 3 to his brother Philip. Philip was a half-brother of Herod Antipas. He also was a son of Herod the Great, but by a different wife. His mother was Mariamne, and in fact, to make it more complex, Herod had two wives named Mariamne. In fact, he had two sons named Philip. So it gets very muddled when you start looking into this. Um, Herod, uh, Herod Philip was married to Herodias. And she's the third character here. Herodias was the daughter of Aristobulus, who was another son 
of Herod the Great, this time uh, by the other Mariamne. And so Herodias was a granddaughter of Herod the Great and was a niece to Herod Antipas and to Herod Philip, who she had married. So you can get your thoughts around all of that. Herod the Great is described by a number of sources as a Jew of Idumean descent, a Jew of Arabic descent. The Jews did not regard him as one of theirs. They regarded him as a foreigner, and obviously his sons carried that lineage as well. Um, what happened is that John the Baptist had opposed Herod's marriage to Herodias, because initially Herod Antipas had been married to Phasaelus, but then met Herodias, the wife of Herod Philip, and had fallen in love with her and she with him. And so they uh, dispatched, not dispatched, they, they didn't kill their wife, but anyway, they, they uh, discarded their wives in order to marry each other. Now, it's rather difficult to get a step-by-step -step, uh, explanation of exactly what took place in this. Um, I'll give you a couple of quotes from um, people who have looked at this. Uh, this is Professor F. F. Bruce. He says that on a journey to Rome, Herod Antipas lodged with Herod Philip and falling in love with Herodias, proposed marriage to her. She con consented on condition that he discussed uh, that he dismissed his Nabataean queen, Phasaelus. So, okay, I'll marry you, provided you get rid of your, your other wife, because she didn't want to enter into a situation as had been the case with Herod the Great, who had had multiple wives. She didn't want to be in a polygamous marriage. Or this is Richard Lenski on the same subject. When Herod Antipas was on a visit to Rome, Herod and Herodias eloped, and the wife of Antipas, not wish, waiting to be divorced, returned to her father. And then uh, Wayne Jackson, uh, they entered into an intrigue whereby the ruler, Herod Antipas, would divorce his wife and Herodias would divorce Philip. Uh, Antipas and Herodias then married one another. So, piecing it together, the basic idea is Herod Antipas is married, uh, Herodias is married, they meet each other, they fall in love with each other, they ditch, if I can put it that way, uh, their spouses and uh, marry each other. And John the Baptist had opposed this, and because of that, Herod Antipas had him imprisoned, but Herodias, she had a real deep-seated grudge against John the Baptist for opposing them, and so when she had the opportunity, she got a husband to have John the Baptist executed. And the point I want to make here is that here was John the Baptist, appointed by God, who had the Holy Spirit, saying that there is a right and a wrong in regard to marriage and divorce and remarriage, and he was saying that Herod Antipas and Herodias were in the wrong. There is a standard, in other words. You might say, yeah, but you're talking about things under the old law here, the old law was still in effect whilst Jesus was alive, the Mosaic law in the Old Testament. All right, let's go to one more passage, and uh, that's over in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, this is definitely part of the New Covenant, Christianity, and you've got a whole range of teachings here related to marriage. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 and 11, we're definitely talking here to Christians married to each other, uh, because if you go on into verse 12, uh, Paul says to the rest, Die not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is not an unbeliever. So in verse 12 and 13, uh, you're talking specifically about Christians married to unbelievers, but here in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 10 and 11, you can say definitely we're talking about a Christian couple, uh, to the married, I give this charge, not I but the Lord, 
the wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. And the King James should not put his wife away. And what's that saying? Well, if, if two Christians are married, then they shouldn't be divorcing each other. Going to find somebody else. They should be committed to one another. Well, that agrees very much with what Jesus had to say a couple of times during his earthly ministry. You can go back to Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 and 32. Uh, this is part of what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus here is speaking, Matthew 5, 31. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. And, uh, there's reference to that back in the book of uh, Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, verse 32. But I say to you, this is Jesus, I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So here Jesus says, again, you, you shouldn't be just tossing your wife aside just because you want somebody else. There's a binding nature to marriage. And uh, Jesus goes into this in even more depth over in Matthew chapter 19, where he's questioned by the Pharisees, Matthew 19 and verse 3. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Okay? Let not man separate they whom God has joined together in marriage. Verse 7, they said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? If you go back to Deuteronomy, it's not a command. Moses had just said, that's what happens. You give a certificate of divorce. Verse 8, Jesus, he said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. So Jesus here is saying, just as Paul said uh, over in 1 Corinthians 7, that you don't just marry and get sick of each other and divorce each other and go off and find somebody else. That's not what marriage is about. The two become one. God puts them together. And it should be that way throughout life. That is God's plan for marriage. Now, some people will hear this and they'll, they'll still um, argue this. Uh, and I've, I've gone through discussions with various people on this all, uh, some people will point to verse 10 and the word separate. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm in 1 Corinthians 7 now. To the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord, that the wife should not separate from her husband. And similarly, if you've got the King James Version in verse 11, it said the, the husband should not put away his wife. And so there are those, and I've had discussions, as I say, who will say, look, of course they can't remarry. If the wife had just separated from her husband, she's not divorced, she's not free to remarry. However, if she did divorce him, then she'd be free to marry. And I have spent hours and hours, uh, particularly here in this section, going through word by word, this uh, the New Testament originally written in Greek, so going through the Greek lexicons and so forth, and it's very clear that the, word, the Greek word translated separate in verse 10 and put away uh, in verse 11 does involve divorce. It's not just talking about separation. It's talking about divorce and saying, 
if that happens, you're not free to just go off and marry whoever attracts your attention. That's not God's way to deal with the situation. Um, the point can also be made here, going on to Christians married to unbelievers, it should never be the case, whoever you're married to, that a Christian breaks up their marriage. Look at verse 11, verse 12, sorry. To the rest, I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. Christians should not be marriage breakers. We made a vow to the one we married. We should not break that vow. We should not break our word. There should be a loyalty there, a commitment there. Um, I've had it said to me by a Christian that, well, if you read 1 Corinthians 7 verses 8 to 9, it says that you can divorce and be remarried. Because basically, if you've been divorced, you're unmarried. And if you're unmarried, Paul says you can remarry. Look at 1 Corinthians 7 verses 8 and 9. To the unmarried and the widows, I say, that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. That's what somebody said to me, therefore, I can marry again. But what's that doing? It's setting verses 8 to 9 in contradiction to verses 10 and 11. If you interpret it that way, Paul is saying in verses 8 to 9, okay, if you've been divorced, it's, you're free to get remarried. But in verses 10 and 11, he's saying if you've divorced, you're not free to get married. So that makes Paul look like he doesn't know what he's talking about. It certainly counters the idea that the apostles spoke through inspiration from the Holy Spirit. We have to interpret in regard to context, not setting one passage against another. So again and again here we come to the idea that marriage is meant to be a lasting commitment. Now I recognise, and we did read this, Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 19, Jesus said, except for the course of sexual immorality. If that has been taken place, then there can be a divorce because there's no longer a commitment to the marriage. It doesn't say there has to be a divorce externally. There can be forgiveness. And I recognise it's hard to work through that situation. But even seeing all of this, there are still Christians who will say, look, I don't go along with what you're saying. I'm free to divorce and to remarry whomever I choose, whoever's going to make my life better. Well, if that's the view you take, then let's just notice Matt, uh, Sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God said. And he goes on to quote there. What does it say here? Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. And somebody will say, well, there's no mention there of marriage. I've made the same point myself. I recognise that. But what we have is a general principle. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And that's the idea. Don't be, don't be bound to unbeliever in such a way as uh, they're influencing you, that they can overwhelm you. If they're stronger, they can have the dominating influence over your beliefs and actions and so forth. Don't allow that to happen. And that's stated as a general principle. So... You could apply it to marriage, you could apply it to business, you could apply it to friendship, uh, whatever you want to think about. 
if you so tie yourself in a relationship with another person, an unbeliever, that they are having a negative influence, you've got a problem. And you need to therefore take a great deal of care in regard to entering into such a relationship. So when some a Christian said, look, it doesn't matter if I divorce and marry somebody else, that's just a decision for me to make. <laughs> Not really. Your spiritual situation is a matter of concern here. If you marry the wrong person, then you're going to be pulling in different directions and that's going to make your Christian life very difficult. And I've seen that happen over the years. You look, listen to this and you say, oh, this is all too hard. Just rules. I just find it hard to take on board. Well, you wouldn't be the first one to say that because the apostles said that themselves. If you go back to uh, where we were over in Matthew chapter 19 when Jesus was speaking about that, uh, uh, within Judaism at that time, uh, in, in many elements of Judaism, Divorce was quite easy, and you know, you just went ahead and I divorced you, and that was it. You could go off and marry somebody else, and so forth. And so, when Jesus here in Matthew 19 talked about uh, the lasting agreement of marriage, the disciples thought, Wow, that's, that's a hard thing to take on board. And in fact, in verse 10 of Matthew 19, they said, This if such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. If we can't just walk out of a marriage and find somebody else, then why get married at all? But he, Jesus, verse 11, said to them, Not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, born that way. There are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this receive it. And Jesus is making the point here, that yes, there are those who have chosen not to marry because of their work in the kingdom, their involvement in the kingdom. Some have made that choice. But there are others, of course, who need to be married, who want to be married. Okay, then. They can marry. But realize the binding, the lasting nature, the commitment that is involved in all of this. So you go to the book of Malachi and God there spoke against divorce saying that marriage was like a covenant, a binding, uh, a solemn mutual agreement. We go to what Jesus says in Matthew 19. He acknowledged what, uh, he acknowledged that Moses had permitted divorce but he said this was only because of people's hardness of heart and this had not been the case from the beginning. That was not God's intention. John the Baptist said that Herod Antipas and Herodias had done wrong in divorcing their spouses in order to marry each other. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians said that Christians should not separate from or divorce their spouses in order to marry others. Indeed, should not be the ones who break up their marriages. And yet it is the case within the world today, within the religious world today, and even among some of our own congregations, that various people are saying the biblical teaching on this is irrelevant. It's out of date and just ignore it. Don't worry about it. Just put it in the too hard basket. And that's really the attitude that I'm trying to get at this morning. That there are people who just don't want to know about it, don't want to think about it. All right, if you want to divorce your husband or your wife, go ahead, don't tell us about it. What, like old Sergeant Schultz in uh, Hogan's Heroes, I see nothing, I hear nothing, don't want to know. But when people particularly Christians are saying that, then they're saying more than that. They're saying that despite what Jesus says in Matthew 5 and Matthew 19, there's no difference between Old Testament teaching and what Jesus teaches. Therefore, just as people felt free to go and divorce their wives in the Old Testament, then we're free to do it today. 
There's no difference. They're ignoring what Jesus says. They're saying that despite everything that the Bible says uh, on the subject, there's no difference between current social attitudes and what God says. So don't worry about it again. Go ahead and do uh, you know, what others are doing. So the idea comes down to this, that Christians are free to marry and divorce and remarry for whatever reason you choose. That's what it comes down to. Well, if that is the case, then what was the point of John the Baptist's criticism of Herod Antipas and Herodian? If God has no view on this matter of marriage, divorce and remarriage, then Herod Antipas and Herodias were free to do as they please, even if it meant breaking up their prior marriages. And therefore, you have to say that John was a bit foolish because he got himself killed unnecessarily for unnecessarily um, commenting on the marriage of Herodias and Herod Antipas. He should have just kept quiet and said nothing. That's what it comes down to if you're going to say that the Bible doesn't mean anything here. But the fact is that God and Christ and the apostles do provide teaching on this subject. And this brings me back to my introduction. Remember over in Matthew 21, beginning in verse 28, the parable of the two sons where the father says to them, go and work in the vineyard. And one says, I won't, but he does. The other says, I will, but he doesn't. The point here is it's the one that went and acted who was obedient, even though initially he said he wouldn't do that. God is our Heavenly Father and he has communicated his will to us in his word. And that includes his will for us in general living. It includes his will for us in regard to married life and to family life and so on. Now, we as Christians say, yes, we are faithful to God. We will obey everything he says. And then we go and ignore what he says in regard to marriage and divorce and remarriage because oh, we don't like that. I was going to photocopy a page of the Bible and stand here and cut out those bits as an illustration so it didn't take too long. But... That's what we're doing in effect. We're saying, God, I'll, I'll follow you except for the bits that I don't like. Is that the way we're going to approach it? Or are we going to commit ourselves to his will in every aspect of our lives? Marriage should not, uh, sorry, divorce should not be treated as the automatic solution to marital problems. I've said it many times here, but there are excellent pre-marriage and marriage guidance programs available from a range of sources. But to quote uh, one of the um, uh, counsellors that I did some training under, he said when it comes to marriage counselling, he said when people come to him for marriage counselling, he always feels negative because he said most people will leave it too late. By the time they come to him, it's a last-ditch effort. They've already made up their minds. And that's the problem. I recognise that there can be difficulties in marriage. I recognise that. With all the... Uh, abuse that's going on, uh, the domestic violence these days, I'm not downplaying that at all. But what I'm saying is we shouldn't wait until it gets to the point of divorce. That's not the way to deal with problems. And next week, Lord Willie, I want to talk about practical ways of dealing with this. Whenever I've counselled couples before marrying them and, and after marrying them, 
we've talked about the fact that it is difficult at times in marriage and there are adjustment problems and so forth. But there's a way through this if we act sooner rather than later. And if we get help, we get advice, we look for strategies. And there's many strategies to help build a marriage, to help build love. It's not just all about romance and starry eyes and chocolates if you're into that sort of thing. But there's more to it than that. So are we willing to take God seriously on this? Are we willing to listen to what he has to say and follow it? And if we're having problems, look for solutions rather than just giving up. Divorce is not the automatic solution. Problems arise. That's human. That's reality. You're bringing two people together with a whole range of background influences and merging them. And that involves a lot of adjustment over time. And sometimes that's not easy. But it can be done. Bob and Mel Bradney, who many of us have heard about if we don't know, married for... 70 years or something like that. Oh, well, it must have been easy for them. No, it's not. <laughs> Think of how far back 70 years takes you and all the issues that you've had to deal with. There is a way that people build lasting, loving, happy marriages. It can be done if we work at it. And if we keep in mind that the way to deal with problems is to deal with the problems rather than tossing one to the side. Because here is the fact, the more often you divorce and remarry, the less likely you are to have a happy marriage. And the statistics demonstrate that. God cares about us, God understands us, God is wise, God has given us healthy, positive guidelines. Let's follow his word and determine that whatever aspect of life it involves, we will do as he teaches us to do. Let's stand.